Now, there is an unconscious desire, which most of us can recognize, for something more than we have ever experienced in this world. A desire for perfection, for perfect joy, perfect beauty, something that we can't quite fully define because when we try to define it, it collapses and we try to make a picture of either an otherworldly heaven or this worldly utopia, it turns out to be kind of boring. And yet we desire something more than we can conceive. Well, that's almost the definition of God. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor has there entered into the heart of man the things God has prepared for those who love him. So either the general principle is wrong, that desire bespeaks the existence of its object, or uh, we're being fooled because the principle is correct in all other cases, but not this one. In which case, life is intelligently designed, but by a malevolent being who lures us with all these appetizers, and then when we die, we find that there's no God after all, and there's no main course, and we just fall into nothingness. Unless our desire is a meaningless trick, it's a, a kind of road map. And if you follow your heart as well as your head, you will be led to something very much like God. Finally, three human or practical arguments. Uh, one of them is the one I, I mentioned already. I call it the insanity argument. If atheism is true, most of the human race is insane. Uh, this is not a, a, a demonstration. It's not a, a proof. It just shows the price you must pay to deny that God exists. The price you must pay is that you must be something of a snob. You must believe that you, uh, one of the few, maybe 5% of, of the human race, are the only sane ones, and that the rest of ordinary people are, are strictly insane. Uh, a somewhat similar argument is the argument from the saints. Are they insane? Those who believe in God the most who are the most certain of God, who trust their lives most entirely to God, who let God direct their lives, are they the biggest fools in the world? If God doesn't exist, they are. Well, in that case, the human heart is very badly designed because the more you follow uh, your intellect, uh, the more you'll become an atheist, and therefore the more you'll have to stifle your heart's deepest desire and your desire for... Uh, an objective foundation of real goodness. That foundation could at best be a kind of platonic form, an abstract category, but not a real person. Is the human heart that badly split? So badly that the smarter you are, the less seriously you'll take the good. And the more saintly you are, the more deceived you are. You can focus that question most uh, extremely on Jesus who, even by the non-Christian standards, was a, a saintly man, a, a wise man, and a good man. Uh, if he's the best and wisest man who ever lived, and if he's also the one who relied on God, whom he called his father, the most, then the wiser you are, the, the stupider you are. The wiser you are morally, the stupider you are philosophically. As I said, that's not a demonstration, but the price you have to pay is trust in the integrity of your humanity. Finally, there's the last argument, which is not an argument for the existence of God at all. It's an argument for believing in God. It's Pascal's wager. It's basically, what are the consequences uh, of belief and unbelief? If God exists and you believe in him, and if at least the Christian version of God is true, in which God gives you free will and respects it and waits for you to accept his gift of himself, since a gift has to be freely accepted as well as freely given, otherwise it's not a gift. In that case, the way to get this thing that your heart desires the most of all is to accept the gift by faith in believing. Now, even if you can't prove that God exists, that's a pretty good investment if you don't have to give up much for it. In fact, you have to give up nothing for it. On the other hand, if God exists and you don't believe in him, you've lost everything. You've lost eternal joy for no reason at all. And finally, if, if, if God doesn't exist, then it doesn't make any difference whether you believe in him or not because there's no life after death and you'll never know. If there were two lottery tickets on this table, one of them was worth a million dollars and the other was worth absolutely nothing, 
and you couldn't prove which one was the real one. And I offered you the chance of buying one of those two tickets sight unseen for a penny, or even $10. Uh, would it be worth your while to, to make the bet? Well, of course. Well, isn't some rudimentary faith at least the world's best practical bet? Especially since the payoff is eternal. But even in this life, Pascal goes on to say in the wager, uh, even in this life is a payoff. Psychiatrists who contain a very large percentage of atheists routinely uh, recommend religion to their patients because they see it makes them happier, it makes them well-adjusted, it makes them live better lives, and it makes them live longer. Once again, why can the human heart be so that, that, that badly designed so that it's illusion that we need the most to make us all the other things that we want? So in defending God, I think I'm also defending humanity. And I've done it in less than 20 minutes. Thank you, Dr. Kraft. We now invite Dr. Corsi to present his case. Is this working? Okay. Uh, first, I thought to start with uh, some characterization of what God is said to be by many theists, if not all theists. And arguing for atheism is something of uh, tr like trying to hit a moving target. Because even different Christians, I think, have different conceptions of what God is. When you get down to the details, they agree on the generalities, but there may be various disagreements about the details. And some of the arguments that I present then may be relevant to some conceptions, but not others. And I'll try to point those out. But it seems that the most common conception of God, or at least some of the characteristics many Christians ascribe to, include God's being the greatest possible being, uh, by his nature being all-powerful, all-knowing, perfectly good, trustworthy, a creator of the universe, worthy of praise and complete devotion, uh, a being that can't be destroyed, a being that's perfectly loving, a being that can freely choose to answer prayers, and so forth. Does that seem in the right direction? More or less? Okay, good. Um, so I'm at the right place. Okay. I'm going to present a few different arguments that a being with these characteristics does not exist. And the first one I'm going to present is a variation on what's known as the problem of evil. And the first thing to note here, I think, is that there are, uh, we can probably agree that there are terrible things that happen in the world. Uh, most recently, the earthquake in Haiti uh, was a horrible disaster. Um, apparently, hundreds of thousands of people have died and considerably more have suffered, have lost loved ones, have lost friends, have lost limbs. A terrible catastrophe. Um, at least we have uh, a strong response to this situation. I'm sure many of you belong to groups that have uh, uh, delivered help to Haiti and help to the people in Haiti to help keep them um, from suffering, from the suffering to continue uh, to try to prevent that, to provide food and water to the people who need it, to provide medicine to the people who need it. Uh, we recognize, you, you, if you've been there, you've probably found, uh, come across a couple of people who have been unhurt. And we hear stories about that, and we think that they're very fortunate for not having lost friends and loved ones uh, in their homes. Uh, these kinds of, of terrible things, I think we all recognize are terrible. Uh, philosophers have a name for them. They call them natural evils. There are things that are bad that occur, but not due directly uh, from human action. And in fact, the world contains quite a few different kinds of, of evils like these. There are natural disasters or accidents beyond earthquakes. There's floods and fires uh, caused by lightning. People get hit by lightning, uh, which result in all kinds of harm and suffering to people and to other creatures. Uh, there are threats from animals and insects uh, to each other and to us. Uh, there are diseases, things like uh, leprosy and cancer and pneumonia and schizophrenia that do terrible harm to people. There are genetic defects such as blindness, uh, children born without limbs, uh, children born with severe deformities. 
and I think we can recognize that, they are that these are bad things. At the same time, of course, some good will come out of these things, right? Uh, uh, for example, the good of providing help to those people that need it in Haiti is certainly a, a great good. Uh, but I don't think any of us really thinks that those kinds of goods outweigh the harm. I doubt few of us thought when we heard of the tragedy in Haiti that, oh, isn't this great? The world's going to be so much better now. Right? That would be a very unusual response to that sort of situation. It would almost be an inhuman response, I think. For almost any good that comes out of these events, Presumably, not only can we help a little bit, but God could help a little bit if he chose to. It would be within God's power, simply by snapping his fingers, I suppose, to prevent all the harm and suffering that occurred in Haiti, or to prevent leprosy or cancer or pneumonia or what have you. These evils are sometimes thought of as pointless evils or unnecessary evils, as philosophers sometimes call them. An evil is pointless if either A, no good great enough to outweigh the evil follows from the evil. Or B, God could create that good. He could get that good without the evil. Those evils are said to be pointless because they're not outweighed by any good that God couldn't otherwise get. Okay. Another thing I'd like to note is that we judge claims people make when they claim to represent the word of God in terms of our own moral standards. Okay? When a person claims, for example, that they shouldn't be punished for having taken their AK-47 into a shopping mall and killing everyone they can find because God told them to, we are, I think, unlikely to believe their claims. We're likely to say, no. That probably wasn't God. It's more likely you're mentally ill. And the reason, I think, is that we recognize if God is a perfectly good and perfectly loving being, he wouldn't instruct someone to do that sort of thing. When people claim that it was God's will that planes flew into the World Trade Center, crowded with people, killing thousands, I think we're inclined to look at that situation and say, no, you've got to be mistaken about that. God wouldn't want you to do something like that. When Pat Robertson claimed that the people of Haiti deserved to die in an earthquake because their ancestors 200 years ago made a deal with a devil, I think most of us recognize that he's a nut. I mean, after all, 96% of the people in Haiti are Christian. Much, much higher percentage than in the United States. Imagine, uh, and again, these are all examples of where we use our moral standards to make a judgment about what someone has claimed about God, right? Imagine that you have lived the perfect saintly Christian life, and you have done all the things that you sincerely thought God wanted you to do. And when you die, you get to meet God. And God, as it turns out, is red and has horns. And he says, yeah, I promised you heaven for living such a saintly life, but I just flipped this coin, and consequently I think I'm going to send you to hell, because that would be most entertaining. I think the response you'd have is, well, you weren't quite who I thought you were, <laughs> right? A being like that couldn't be God. Because a being like that wouldn't do that sort of thing. The problem of evil is built on these very kinds of commonsensical accounts, judgments that we have, moral judgments about what people believe. Okay? Uh, 